All right, welcome everyone. This is my brand new segment, Jack Talks with Humans. It's exactly what it sounds like. I talk with humans who I am interested in. Uh, have I got a human for you today? We have with us the famous Mark Sargent uh, to chat with me. You might have seen Mark, uh, those of you who are tuning in to watch this video on my brand new YouTube channel. You might have seen Mark in various uh, media interviews. You might have seen him on his YouTube channel or, of course, as the star of the documentary, Behind the Curve. Uh, welcome, Mark. Good morning. How are you? Hello. I am well. Thank you for, for much, so much for having me. And just so everyone knows, it is 7 o'clock a.m. on the West Coast of the United States, where I am right now. Wow, impressive. Uh, Mark just told me before we started recording that he, he got up about eight minutes ago. I told him yep. I have not thought of a time when I want to have a conversation with someone eight minutes after I wake up, but I'm already impressed uh, by his spirit and commitment to uh, talking to a random guy. <laughs> so. That's why I'm wearing a hat, by the way. I have not shaved. Uh, this is about as bad as it gets for me. It's a, it's a good look for you. I like it. So. Thanks. Uh, that is how I introduced myself to Mark when I emailed him. I said, I'm a random guy from Ohio. Would you like to have a conversation? And he said, yes. It tells you what type of accessible person we're talking to here. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, hey, I called you the star of the documentary Behind the Curve. Is that right? Can we call you a star? Is that okay? Uh, I mean, it, it, I, am, I am the lead protagonist in the film, uh, the even though when it was made, nobody knew who was going to be what. Ah. The, uh, the the filmmakers from Los Angeles uh, they contacted me and they said, "Hey, we'd like to do you know a, a documentary thing. Uh, how would you like to be in it? And then could you put us in contact with different people?" And so I did, and we shot with them off and on for seven months. And so yeah, uh, at the end, I did not know literally until I went to the Toronto Film Festival uh, a couple of years ago what it was going to look like. And by the time I was done, it's like, oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. So. <laughs> The lead protagonist. There you go. I like that phrase. Yeah. Gives me an indication of uh, how you're situated there in the uh, in the film. Let me just ask you about the film. I was going to recommend people watch it, but I want to ask you, what's your sure. take on it? Did, uh, the finished product there is that uh, did it strike you as a fair take? Was it? Uh, a oh fair yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, no. I everything that I predicted in the film that was going to be uh, by the time they were done editing was pretty much spot on. Which was the flat Earth community hated it. <laughs> Everybody in the flat Earth community hated it. But the uh, the general audiences, and I sat in with a number of studio audiences anonymously, um, they were very, very curious about it. And that was the whole point. It was about as balanced as you could get. Meaning people, in fact, it was weird because when the directors were, when we went to different film festivals, when the director went up on stage, the first question ever asked by anybody was, are you guys flat earthers? And they were asking us to the director. Nobody in, tied to the production of this film was a flat earther at all. They hated flat Earth, um, but it was good. It was a good balance because you had flat Earth. It wasn't if you use a drug reference. It wasn't pure uncut flat Earth. It was flat Earth, flat Earth scientist, flat Earth, flat Earth psychiatrist, flat Earth, flat Earth astronaut. And I could see people in the audience. You know, it's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay because there's somebody in from science up on the screen. But what was interesting was for the first 30 minutes of that movie, nobody even thought it was real, meaning they thought it was a piece of docufiction. Literally thought it was like a, some sort of weird parody. In fact, there was a, a wonderful little um, story out of Los Angeles, one of the, another editor from a different film company who had no context. He was just given the film. He said, watch this. At the end, he's going, wow. He goes, he goes what sort of budget did you have for this movie? And, and they're going, what are you talking about? And he goes, all those actors, they played it so straight. And, and the, he honestly thought it was a complete piece of docufiction. They go, no, man, it was real. He goes, that conference, it actually happened? So, yeah. Um, but your follow-up question might be, would I have changed anything? In yeah, it? yeah. Um, uh, not much, believe it or not. I, if the Flyers community didn't want anybody, they didn't want any opposing views whatsoever. I, I asked people, I, many Flat Earthers, and they said, oh yeah, I would have ripped out that psychiatrist. Rip, I go, you realize you're ripping out every antagonist in the film. I go, you, you're turning it into a propaganda piece. You might as well do it in black and white newsreel style from the 40s, from, from a war movie. You know, and, you know, the war marches on, you know, the flat earth. That's, and the only thing I would have changed would have been probably the stinger at the end for Jaren, the, the laser thing that they did because it was a little bit of unfair editing, but it worked. 
Meaning, you know, I sat there in the audiences. The audience had this wonderful little feel-good moment at the end. It's like, okay, I don't have to take them that seriously because something went wrong there. And I asked audiences, I said, do you know what went wrong? No, but it was bad, right? I'm okay, right? Flat Earth isn't a thing, right? And then they then they go on their way. But it was still it was still a massive recruitment thing for us uh, in the end. If you if you believe the ends justify the means. Uh, and I do, I'm a huge believer of that, uh, that my email load, which was already pretty heavy, when mm. Netflix picked it up and ran with it, it was picked up by Amazon and, and other groups beforehand, iTunes and stuff like that. But right after Netflix picked it up, my email load doubled. Wow. Literally doubled. And it was like, oh, wow. So I, I had no idea that Netflix literally is the default entertainment system for people basically under the age of 30. It's like, that's your biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, definitely wide viewership there. So anybody who's listening to that who's not familiar, Behind the Curbs is a documentary. You can find it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, Mark was referring to there at the end, uh, he referred to the stinger at the end. There's a, a, a portion of the film they're doing some experiments uh, yep. to demonstrate uh, the curvature of the Earth or lack thereof. And that's what yep. he's referring to. And they, and by the way, they didn't even want to do experiments in the film. Uh, it was supposed to be a human interest piece. It was literally, and I did not know this until the. Um, <clears throat> I knew it was going to be a human interest piece, but I didn't know what their opinion on was was their opinion on it was until they did um, uh, the director's commentary on the iTunes version. And I was listening, and I don't know if you remember, there was when I was at the conference, there was a twelve-year-old kid that came up to me, came up to the microphone, and was asking me questions. I do at the, remember at the that. Conference. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm listening to the directors come and saying, they're going, yeah, this is the moment right here where we had to take a stand against Flat Earth. It's like, whoa, 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 you guys, this, this is news to me. What the hell? Hmm. And it was because they said, well, you know, you know the old saying, it's all fun and games until kids are involved. And they hmm. said, well, sure, yeah. we're, we're mess you're messing with the future here. It's like, okay, first, if and I completely disagreed with them, but second, it's like, okay, well, then why we even show it? <laughs> you know, why even show that 12 year old kid? It's like, oh, they're a threat. It's like, well, if you really wanted to be clever about it, you just would have sh wouldn't have shown any of that stuff hmm. because you would be amazed how many junior high and high school classrooms called me up after that. I my my the, the level of interviews the age range just dropped so i had i mean i literally had kids from junior high schools like outside of teacher parent or parent teacher supervision calling me you know why i wanted to talk about this stuff anyway go ahead wow yeah well uh i appreciate you sharing that the reason i was asking i didn't want to i was going to promote the film uh to yeah. take a look at that anybody who wants to learn more about this uh, sure. uh kind of an overview of the flat earth uh take on things you could look there but let me uh back up a little bit i just jumped right in there might be people who watch this video who aren't familiar with you or your work so let me just oh right right uh, right let me just start out with an intro why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about the work you do uh what, do you, what are you passionate about what <laughs> is right. what is uh, what is it you are pat if i said Describe to me your mission. What is your cause? How would you describe it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Mark Sargent. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I am a recruiter for the metaphorical university that is known as Flat Earth. So Flat Earth University, freshman recruiter. You, there are, there are lots of people in our community that have more advanced topics and more advanced content than I do. But chances are, if you're getting into it, your first year, you're going to run into my stuff. Uh, it's easy to understand, extremely easy to understand because of the training I've had over the years. I can boil down complex topics into sound bites, basically. Mm. And that's what I did. I created a series of sound bites called Flat Earth Clues, put them out on the internet back in beginning part of 2015. Really didn't think much of them other than it's like, well, I'm putting out this question to the internet hive mind. The internet's very, very sh smart that way. And said, come back, hit me with it. And, you know, put out my contact information. I mean, every everything you're not supposed to do on the internet. And, and well, you still I found should... you. So, yeah, it must have Yeah, exactly. Worked. It's like, you know, name, email, physical address, social security number. Here's my bank routing number. You know, all that stuff. And people came back at me uh, almost immediately and said, yeah, it's not that crazy. Here's why. And then just things started to progress. And here we are five years later with uh, three books, a Netflix thing, TV commercial. Uh, I don't know how many conferences. I don't know how many. I mean, 1,500 videos just, just on my channel. It's just been nutty, absolutely nutty. And none of it I wanted to do. Literally none of it. I, I had no intention. Nobody wants to do this. Everybody hates Flat Earth going on, including me. <laughs> 
Interesting. I would like to explore that here in a little while. And uh, let me just say, uh, I want to introduce myself just because uh, you didn't tune in to watch me. But let me give you a quick uh, context for our conversation here. Uh, to be clear, anybody who's watching this who doesn't know me or my position, I am not, in fact, a flat earther. I am what you would call a flat earth skeptic or a, uh, am I a round earther? Do you have terms um, around me? Do you, what, do you call yeah. us something? No, no, no. We, you know, the the term I, I that I think is probably the most uh, palatable is probably a globalist. How's that? Because we globalist, okay, globalist. Because yeah. we don't even use the word um, round when referring to the globe. Um, because round could be you know a dinner dinner table, you know your your dinner plate and stuff like that. Uh, globe, sphere, ball, something three dimensional. Because you know round is, but that's that's fine. And again, I you qualifying that you would be like many many people that I have talked to, yeah. where they say, you know, in fact, uh, hell, the Alex Jones show backed out. I remember years ago because they they literally said they said if we do a, a flat Earth show, how many minutes can we actually do without actually saying the term flat Earth? And I go, why? They go, oh, because we're worried about backlash. You know, the people people are just gonna freak out. So, but you won't have to worry about that yet because you're fairly new to the game. Ah, people can freak out if they want. That's okay. But, uh, I'm, <laughs> they, I'm just glad you didn't say it. Very polarizing. So be <laughs> careful. I, I believe it. You you would know. I'm sure you've received all sorts of uh, interactions with people. Probably oh, yeah. not always the most pleasant. But uh, 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 it's it's not as bad as you might think because the, luckily for me, it's not. It's more about the message. It's not about the messenger. You know, even after the documentary, I didn't have a lot of people. You, you would have thought I would have just been inundated with people saying, uh, oh, you're a dork, you're a moron, you're stupid, and stuff like that. And they, they didn't because you, it's not about me. It's it's about the the message itself, and it's very very old. Anyway, so go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I just wanted to mention that Mark knew going into this conversation that he's talking with a skeptic. I mentioned that I was very forthright about that. I did, I wanted to make clear that I wasn't uh, necessarily uh, in his camp, so to speak. That's kind of yeah. not necessarily that we're drawing dividing lines here in our Zoom call today. But uh, just to be clear, if you were hoping for someone uh, who was already in the flat Earth community, I would consider myself a. I was gonna. I asked you uh, if you could, if I call myself a, a round earther or what. You you might call me and uh, thankfully you didn't call me a sheep i was very uh happy no that no no out. and by the way you should be skeptical <laughs> everybody that's listening to this should be skeptical you don't don't think that anybody in our community and i'm not kidding you mm -hmm. i'm not exaggerating when i say this everybody in our community hated flat earth going in the t-shirt literally reads i became a flat earther because i tried to disprove it everybody goes in including me i mean i was a huge conspiracy guy in the terms that i mean not tinfoil hat stuff but I had an opinion, hey, look, I grew up in the tech field, never got married, never had kids, and, you know, big nerd, you know, especially in my career, taught proprietary software for 20 years. And so I went down a lot of rabbit holes because the internet was new. I mean, I was going down rabbit holes when it's like there were only a few rabbit holes on the internet. It's like 9-11, yeah, let's go down there. And so by the time I got into Flat Earth, I had pretty much run the, 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 the whole buffet of Flat Earth to where I was bored. The only reason I went down the Flat Earth rabbit hole is because like, I've seen, you know, you know, like you're going through Netflix nowadays. It's like, seen it, seen it, seen it, seen it, seen it. Is there anything left? Fine, I'll start watching the foreign dub stuff. That is what happened with me with Flat Earth and got into it and it's like, oh man, it's a terrible thing to go into. But once you start getting into it, it's really tough to pull back. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so I, I acknowledge this to you in our earlier interaction, and so I'll just kind of frame the conversation for anybody listening in. Uh, yep. My goal today, if, if you were hope, watching this video, someone hoping to see a debate about whether or not the Earth is flat, uh, that's not really what Mark and I uh, set up to do today. I am not going to be debunking flat Earth claims today. I don't believe that Mark has the intention of debunking any particular uh, evidence or any claims in that way. Uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately about thinking, uh, the way we think, the way we f uh, process information, um, how we arrive at conclusions. And so the conversation that I asked Mark to have with me today is I just kind of want to pick his brain a little bit about how he thinks, how he arrives at conclusions. And so, uh, again, I don't think either one of us are trying uh, to prove one position uh, to uh, the other during this conversation. I think it's more about, I guess, Mark, what I'm trying to say is I'm less interested today in what you believe. I'm more interested in why you believe it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I the, the a, a, am I a more yeah. articulate version of Forrest Gump? Probably not. <laughs> um, but yeah, why, why I think the way I do. Um, in fact, I'm a little different in that 
I don't believe... Uh, a lot of conspiracy people have uh, issues with me because I don't take the, the common stance of conspiracies in general. I mean, most conspiracy people, it's all dark and sinister, and it, it's like, my favorite movie is Heath Ledger's Batman, you know, stuff like that. They they really want... They, it's really, really dark. I mean, everyone wears shades of black, and, and they talk in whispers. And it's like, no, for me, uh, it is... Uh, my qualifier for any conspiracy is, do the ends justify the means? Is it for the greater good? And I don't know if you're a huge movie ba fan, but every time I say that, you know, Shaun of the Dead, <laughs> the greater good. <laughs> Seriously, I it's constantly rings in my head, and that is, are decisions made out there? Look, we all know there are conspiracies in the world, um, and some many are media sanctioned. What, what I like to call it. it's like we we all know, you know, in, in politics and business and sports and entertainment and journalism, and yes, even science, there are conspiracies. There's a line drawn in the sand. And there's stuff that we believe in and there's stuff we don't believe in because it's uncomfortable. It's outside our comfort zone. And in fact, the media doesn't even use the word conspiracies when they when they sanction it. It's either a scandal uh, unless people die and then it's a tragedy and then they try to explain it. And then if it's fringe, well, it's conspiracy. It's not proven and blah, blah, blah. So for me, that's, that's why I qualify something. When, when I look at it, I say... Do, you know, if I try to put myself in the shoes of whoever is supposedly doing the conspiracy and I say, did, are they doing this for a, a greater reason? Star Trek reference. Um, I use a lot of pop culture references. I'm way worse. That's all right. I'm, I'm a pop culture guy. It's oh, okay. Uh, the, the needs of the many, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that is, look, it, we, we all know that, that some decisions are made that have sacrifices have to be made. We do, we, it happens in, in war. It happens in civilian life. It happens all the time. And that's why I look, when I look at things, I try to be as objective as I can. And I say, okay, is this being done? Is there a, is the, you know, I try to see it, when I look at a conspiracy, I say, could I improve on the meaning of it? Meaning, you know, it's like, a, why is it happening? Who's doing it? And does it make sense? And if that's the case, you know, it's like, for example, when, and because now I'm into flat earth and stuff, my, you know, if you get into flat earth, you're pretty much open to anything, at least looking at it. Beforehand, five years ago, if you would have said, oh, yeah, by the way, I know a guy who swears that uh, he, um, that Bigfoot had Elvis's baby, right? One of those mm -hmm. deals. Sure. It'd be like, yeah, get the hell out of here. But now, I swear to God, and it's like, now you, you know, I'll give you a few minutes. What do you got? <laughs> you know, hit, hit, hit me with it. I mean, because how, how, can, I, how can I judge you? You know, mm -hmm. I, I literally start my day with the whole, the whole flat earth concept. Anyway, so I, hopefully that's a decent overview. So. That does give me some interesting things. I, I, a couple of things you said there are fascinating. One of them is you said, we all know there are conspiracies. You said, we know there are conspiracies right. out there. Right. I, I guess my question would be, uh, what, what is your process? How do you determine that right. there is a conspiracy there? Because uh, in my mind, a conspiracy, that, that's a claim. There's a claim that there's someone behind this, that there well, is something okay. going on. So how do you arrive at that conclusion? Let's go through the legal definition first, because there's a lot of stuff the media leaves out. And it's weird, because like, I know firsthand, absolutely, the conspiracy is used in our court, court system all the time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, like, for example, if you decide to rob a bank, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, own, sure. You'll be as, with, as you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. It may, next time you rob a bank, right. you'll be charged with armed robbery. However, if you and three of your friends mm -hmm. rob a bank, a lot of people don't know this. You'll be charged with two things, armed robbery and conspiracy to commit armed mm -hmm. robbery. Conspiracy sure. is literally just three or more people conspiring to do something either illegal or unethical or both. That's, mm -hmm. that's all it is. Sure. And so when it, look, things, things happen in, in, I mean, so little conspiracies like i don't know politics is too easy let's not even go down politics i mean people people commit conspiracies in politics all the time but like business um uh enron happened you know it, the enron scandal you know the massive oil and gas company out of, of of texas where not only it wasn't even just that enron took down you know the government had to change entire federal policies because enron found a loophole but enron paid uh, arthur anderson which used to be an accounting firm a million dollars a day to cook the books a massive conspiracy huge financial conspiracy but the me but for whatever reason the word conspiracy now through media and pop culture and stuff like that has now been turned into like oh you're into conspiracies like no mm -hmm. there are conspiracies all the time 
I mean, I, I could literally, you could, I could spend all day on just about any topic you could think of with actually legitimate conspiracies. I could spend a day talking about Tom Brady, you know, and the, and the whole deflate gate thing. It's like, look, he didn't do it by himself. Mm -hmm. When you don't do something by yourself, if other people help you to do something that is unethical or illegal, then it is mm -hmm. a conspiracy. Um, but when it comes to the fringe stuff, what qualifies it for me, again, is does it make sense <sighs> tactically? Again, for the greater good. And I, I don't want to get in. You know, there's all sorts of conspiracies I, I could bring up for you. Um, but does do does that conspiracy, when you look at it, understand why it happened? Is the, is the ultimate goal of why the conspiracy happened, does it make enough sense to actually do the conspiracy? Just again, just because something is not in the new, you know, just because the media doesn't cover it, or they say, well, no, that's fringe stuff, that's, that's fringe, that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that it's more well hidden, or it's, that, sorry, there's a lot of references I could give here, but uh, mm -hmm. let me give you a quick uh, one from FDR one of our old presidents, right? Mm -hmm. President sure, during sure. World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had a wonderful quote. I love quotes from people. Uh, they sum up stuff in a great little soundbite. He says, only give people as much truth as they can handle. Meaning, or another version that would, in show business, like never tell people how bad it is. And this, it, that's very, very true. Um, sometimes, especially with the general public, there's no reason to tell people Kind of like why things are compartmentalized, you know, in, in various operations. You don't tell people the, the whole scope of things because a lot of them can't take it. Uh, the Manhattan Project, a great example. Uh, you know, the building of the atomic bomb in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, huge refinement uh, facilities in three different parts of the country. Everything compartmentalized to where hundreds of thousands of people were doing this, but nobody knew exactly what the ultimate goal was. And really, you wouldn't want to tell them what the ultimate goal was. Not just because, oh, it might get leaked over to Japan or Germany or whenever we were going to finish it, but because it's like it was too big for them. You know, mm -hmm. you nobody wants to drop an atomic bomb on civilian populations, but we did it anyway. Now you can say, well, we got to justify it because we were going to lose a million, you know, million lives, whatever they're going to say, you know, to, to take out the islands. We needed them to surrender. Or did we want to make a statement? It was, it was, was one of those... You know, the United States, exclamation point, stamp. <laughs> That's it. You know, we, we, you, finish the, um, you finish the war with a slam dunk and let everyone else know. It's like, yeah, don't mess with us type thing. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. That was, that, that was helpful to me because uh, one of my questions was going to be for you if, if uh, it stops at Flat Earth with you or if you see uh, conspiracies elsewhere. It's clear to me that you've got, uh, uh, just from what I'm hearing you describe, it sounds as if you're willing to at least entertain various uh, oh, theories. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Let, let's, get, let's, let's get into a few real fast because I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I could spend all literally all day on just any particular one. But I try, to boil, I try to boil them down into very, very small paragraphs uh -huh. because people are lazy. <laughs> they, they, they are. We, we, I mean, there's a reason why um, we switched from voice to text. Mm -hmm. And that was it, it was socially easier to do. It wasn't physically easier to do. I mean, my keyboard, I can rip through stuff. Or, but I can talk a lot. <clears throat> I can talk a lot faster. Mm -hmm. we, we, the, the, was the art of war great quote from the art of war people are like water they always take the path of least resistance so they like the learning the, they like the easy stuff so uh fine we'll, we'll, we'll get into a few um 9-11 when anyone asked me about oh was 9-11 a conspiracy i go um building seven why why did it fall why did it fall you know five hours later when a fire was in the basement it wasn't hit by a plane rosie o'donnell uh who was on a uh, host on the view she brings up 9 11 and and she brings up building seven literally in the air they banned her for like three four years just play was it she was gone you don't lot most americans don't even know that building seven even fell it's like look they they all they know is about the towers that that's 9 11 mm -hmm. Can I, can, I tell you what the, can I tell you what that sounds like to me? I don't mean right. to interrupt, but what, is, what it sounds like you're saying, now correct me if I'm wrong, all right? what it sounds like you are saying yeah. is that if you can find a pattern, if you can imagine a pattern, if you can, if you can ascertain one, if you can, um, though I think the way you phrased it was, if you can Connect make sense of it, if yeah. you can make yeah. sense of it for the, for the greater good, yeah. uh, is that demonstration that the conspiracy is actually there? In other words, if I can conceive of a conspiracy, is that evidence that the conspiracy actually exists? 
For the most part, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one that's not even uh, an exclusive one I came up with real fast. Well, the 9-11 thing, I'll, I'll give you real fast, which is, um, look, we... And I'm not, I'm not trying to be glib. I'm not trying to be ultra blunt when I say this. But sure. look, America is a resource consumer. We consume a huge amount of resources. And for lack of, of a better statement, we need the oil. We do, we do, we do. Uh, look, we, we the oil boom in the United States has been gone for a long time. And we know where, they are, where the oil is. And we had to take it. Unfortunately, mothers don't like sending their, their sons to fight for things but they absolutely will fight for uh, revenge. It is literally one of the oldest tricks in the book, if not the oldest trick in the book. And that is you walk up to someone, you hit them in the back of the head, and when they turn around, you point to the guy next to you. It is literally one of the oldest tricks in the book, and it works it works almost every time without fail. Um, what you know, How would you get into the Middle East? Revenge, that's how you do it. And you do it as, as, as quickly and as dramatically as you can. And I would I have done the same thing? Maybe not exactly the same thing, but it worked, and we are there over there permanently. Let me give, but let me give you a one that, that most people—it's not as controversial, but you'll you'll understand this. And I, it's it was in my last book, and I came up with it completely on my own. No one's ever touched it. You can look up on the web all day long. Oh, good. Okay. Which is uh, the Panama Canal? Is that a conspiracy? Now, at first glance, you'd be like, no, of course not. It's, it's an engineering marvel. It's, it's a great thing, but it's not a sure. like, Oh, Okay. Uh, there's all sorts of engineering marvels out there. Hoover Dam, for example. Hoover, Hoover mm -hmm. Dam was, you know, wonderful, fantastic structure. Uh, how many people died during the making of that? About 70. Makes sense. You know, people fall, there's trucks, turns over. I mean, you know, it's not like the, I mean, back in, you know, back in the day, people died during construction. Probably. We're a little safer now, but people still die from sure. time to time, right? How many people died during the construction of the Panama Canal? The better part of 6,000. Wow, that's pretty impressive considering it's just a ditch. Basically, it's being dug through the jungle. So how, why'd they all die? And wouldn't surprise you, of course. And most people will just go, oh, okay. When I say, well, they died, died of malaria and yellow fever. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, of course, it's expected. Again, the Heath Ledger line. It's like, well, it's part of the plan. We know people die of malaria and yellow, yellow fever. It's not surprising. I go... There's no conspiracy in that. And I go, well, what if I told you they knew they were going to die? Meaning they knew full well that one in eight people that went down there were going to die of this. And they sent them anyway. And you say, well, they didn't know. I go, well, yeah, they did. Because we didn't start the Panama Canal. The French did. The French did in the late 1800s. And the French didn't have mosquito netting and, and insect repellent. And they lost so many men that they quit. They just gave up. They, they were protesting in Paris. They lost 21,000 men. I mean, huge amounts. That's a lot of men back in the late dating terms. That's shiploads of people just, just dropping like mosquitoes. And the, um, when, they, when they, they, they just put down their shovels, literally abandoned all their equipment and left. And we came down there. So, you know, and so there's a, imagine a meeting, a logistic side for the United States government. They say, how many men do you think we're going to lose doing this? It's like, I don't know, maybe, you know, with our advanced stuff, maybe 10,000. It's like, uh, yeah, let's do it anyway. Do the ends justify the means in this case? Yeah, it does. Absolutely does. It is the military naval choke point of the entire world. There is no more strategic naval choke point more valuable than this. It is also the most expensive toll road in the world. We made millions and millions and millions and millions of, I mean, probably billions in adjusted dollars from ships that have to go through because otherwise you have to go around the Cape, you know, to do this. Everybody knows this. So where's the conspiracy? The conspiracy is that you don't tell people the danger going in and you sacrifice lives to do it. And again, the, this is a great example of do the ends justify the means? In my opinion, yes, they do. Yes, they do. We, we, and we've done this in just about every American war you can think of, um, mm -hmm. where the conspiracy comes in. And that is, um, uh, real quick, uh, what would be the first one? Uh, you sacrifice the Alamo, for example, the you know the, down in Texas, uh, just a fort with 200 men. You don't send reinforcements. You let the Mexican army overrun them, and then you use that as a war cry. And what do you get out of that? For those 200 guys, what do you get? You get Texas, New Mexico, because there used to be an old Mexico, uh, Arizona, and that worthless piece of real estate called California. Trillions of dollars worth of real estate for 200 guys. Oh, yeah. 
piece of cake. Uh, sacrifice the battleship Maine. You blow it up yourself, right? Back in the, for the uh, Spanish-American War. Most people don't even know we even went to war with Spain. What do you get for that? You trade, again, 200 lives. You get Guam, Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippines. We could have probably even taken Cuba if we put a little more effort into it. And Teddy Roosevelt. That's, that's what got Teddy Roosevelt on Mount Rushmore. I was just brilliant. I mean, there's all sorts of little conspiracies, you know, pawns that are sacrificed in different chess games that end up, again, it's not supposed to be sinister, gloomy. It's just the cost of doing business sometimes. There are decisions made out there that the general public doesn't get to make. They don't. It's, it's the impossible choice for people. The old saying, again, I don't want to ramble too much, um, which is, would you sacrifice a child to cure cancer? Some people would say yes, some people would say no. And then you qualify and say, yeah, but what if it's your child? It's the impossible choice. You can't make it. Even though you, you know full well, you know, the needs of the many. Well, that decision, some of those decisions are taken out of your hands and they are made. And some of them are made public, some of them aren't. If they're made public, they're completely sanctioned. If they're not made public, they're conspiracies. There you go. I appreciate you. I let you. I let you uh, share that without interrupting because I. You actually, what you were doing is you were giving me an example of what I was referring to a moment ago. I said, uh, if if you can conceive of or if you can make sense of a pattern or a conspiracy theory of some kind, is right. that sufficient reason to believe it? And then you right. gave me an example uh, from from my, a moment ago. We talked about uh, being skeptics. You said you encourage people to be skeptics. Yeah. In my mind. Uh, a skeptic is someone, there's two components to me to being a skeptic. One is we accept claims with proper justification. The second part of that is a willingness to revise our views or rev revise, change our mind when new information is presented. So right. to listen to you say that you gave the, the legal um, definition of conspiracy. I'll point out in the legal world, we can be charged with conspiracy when there is sufficient evidence that a conspiracy has taken place or transpired. So I yes. guess what, I'm, what I want to ask you, you gave us an example there of, of a pattern that you have discerned uh, and throughout history. You've actually tied the Panama Canal to several other events. Yep. My question to you is when you get a new piece of information, when you're reading, when you're studying, when you come across a new piece of information, what is your process for determining uh, whether this is a part of the conspiracy or whether there might be another explanation for this piece of information? Uh, I look at the cost benefit. Whenever I get a, um, any sort of information, whatever it is, I, I, again, try to fit it into the puzzle. But the big thing is I say, okay, does somebody gain or does somebody lose from it? And is the reason why it's being hidden because you know that there's going to be backlash? So so the standard of measure is... Our uh, if I, I want to know again, I'm not trying to yeah, put yeah. words in your mouth, so please no, do it's fine, it's fine. Mis, if I ever misconstrue or misstate your no, position, no, 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 no. Correct me. You're fine, you're fine. Uh, what I hear you saying is if you yourself, the standard here of determining whether or not there's conspiracy is can you make sense of it by fitting it in the pattern in some way? Is that right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, again, I'm a little different from your, your normal conspiracy guy because I will put myself all day long, in fact, it's one of the, my favorite things to do, in the government's shoes, which is why I get probably get accused of being an agent all the time. I... Uh, I you're seriously do. Being an agent? Is that what you're oh saying? yeah, I get accused of being an agent all the time. Oh yeah, you've Even got my own vibes. I can tell. Uh, pff, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, but 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 I do. I mean, I because I will look from the agency side. I will say, if I was the government, but let's boil it down. If I was the government, would I do this or would I do it this way? And I'll stare. I'll look hard. I'll go. Yeah. What do I get out of it? What do I get out of it? If I'm the government, you know, or the powers that be, as we mm -hmm. like to call them. Um, you know, if, if there's a benefit to it and, and you realize it's like, okay, if I'm the powers that be and I get something out of it and it's something you really don't want to be transparent with the public about because you're like, eh, they're not going to like this very much. The, some, one of the, my favorite quotes is, um, some things are just better left unsaid. It's true. It's like, it's true. And, and I have done this. I mean, I have done this personally, you know, even in microscopic things of power. I used to be the um, president of a, um, an HOA out in Colorado. And there were things that happened during our private meetings that we were like, we'd like look around and be like, yeah, so we're going to do this. We're going to put this in the minutes. Anyone? No. Okay, then. <laughs> and we'll move forward because it's like, there's no reason to, there's a lot of things the general public just doesn't need to know. Uh, to use how many times have we heard this ignorance is bliss 
And there's a lot of things that, that I believe there are a lot of decisions that are made, even conspiracies that no one knows about, including me, that are made just because like, yeah, you know what, just keep the public, you want to keep the public as happy as possible. You don't want them, you know, just completely wringing their hands all the time, especially about what you are doing, because you don't want to be overthrown or even talk about it. If people, you don't want people pointing at you. It's like, what you're doing is unethical or whatever, or you should have, con you know, you should have consulted the public. It's like, uh, don't have to, don't have mm -hmm. to do it. You know, it's kind of like the, the private company thing. Um, you know, no, no shirt, no shoes, no service, right? People forget that. It's like, oh, you're being, you know, you're discriminating. It's like, no, it's a private company and governments come along. Uh, let's not even get into that. So you said you, you put yourself in the, in the shoes of who you believe to be uh, behind the conspiracy. In this case, you said the government might be an example. You put yourself yeah. in their shoes. And yeah. if you can make sense of a conceivable reason how this would fit in the pattern, yeah. that's that's justification. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, so and I you say think to you, it, it I, say, sound... I say Mark Sargent stuffs cotton candy up his nose. And so I put myself in Mark's shoes and I say, you know what? He might like the feel of it. He might enjoy the attention of getting cotton candy in his nose. I can make sense of it. Therefore, it must be true that Mark Sargent sticks cotton candy up his nose. Is that is it? That does it? Case? Does it? No. Okay. Would it? Does that mean it absolutely must be true? No. Ah, okay. No, but it makes it a lot more plausible. I see. Uh, like, like for example, uh, the the whole um, sacrificing of of the Alamo, for example, it's a good move. It's it's a good move. You you because remember, st Texas was trying to be an independent country, and the government didn't want that. And so they're like, okay, look, we'll give you statehood. Because they were also like, we'll take statehood. We'll give you statehood. But in addition, we're going to use that as momentum and just keep heading west. And just carve out a, a thing for, you know, away from Mexico. And it's like, you, you look back, uh, you know, hindsight. You know, they say, you know what? That's a solid move. I mean, investment-wise, ask any anyone in, in high finance. It's like return on investment? Oh, my God. So, and, and also, by the way, and I, again, I'm not trying to be dark and weird or anything, but I am a sure. huge, huge believer of, um, you, there's some people that say, well, you can't put a price on human life. Yes, you can all day long, every single day. You can put a price on human life. We do it all the time, not just in the military. We, we do it in corporations all the time and we used to do a lot more and uh, People don't like hearing that because then all of a sudden they, they relate it personally. They say, well, you can't put a price on my life or you can't put a price on my family's life. It's like, no, you cannot put a price on your mother or your father's life. You can't do it. But objective powers absolutely can because they are not looking at you in the same context. They are looking at you at a, on a much, much bigger board. And, you know, pieces have certain values to them. But that's what happens. I mean, come on. The reason why they call them pawns in the first place. And I'm not, again, not trying to be weird when I say sure. that. Sure. I, I believe it. As I listen to you speak, it seems to me that there is, and again, tell me if I'm wrong here. It sounds to me, in, in your way of thinking, there doesn't seem to be much distinction between claims and evidence. Um, a portion of what you that you've, what you've just shared with me, it, it's a variety of claims. In other words... Uh, when I say claim, it's not necessarily you said you may not have 100% certainty about something, but it's plausible. Right. Uh, but to put forth the idea uh, that, uh, for example, uh, you were mentioning the Panama Canal, the Alamo, all these different things, you right. have stated uh, that because it is potentially possible that those things were done in that way, um, that you find that to be plausible. And so I guess, is, is there a distinction in your mind between claims and evidence? Not much. Uh, only because I keep I keep tumbling over the the three dimensional idea in my head, and I keep looking for ways to improve upon it. Now I've revised things over the years, you know, different different ideas, um, but it, it, until I can, it's kind of mm -hmm. like science in a way. Until I can, that's the what I'm what I'm going with. You know, science is one of those one of those famous things I say about science. So I shouldn't say it's famous, which is science is true until it's not. <laughs> you know, science is you know this is it, and then all of a sudden it's like nope, it's not that anymore. It's like now this is the new it. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, okay, it frustrates me, but but I do that sometimes too. I mean, I think everybody does. You know, you mm -hmm. you go with what you know, and then if that has to be revised, well, then you either accept it or you don't. That's the tough part for some people. Some people are really sticklers. It's like nope, nope, that's it. That's you know they mm -hmm. dig in their heels and that's it. And, and you're right, it does. A lot of the times it does come down to evidence or, yeah, 
or or an opinion again something that makes more sense to you because for me peer pressure and the overwhelming opinion of the masses doesn't really do anything for me for me it's it's got to make sense for me so i i'm See, one of those guys that i've never have been for, i was just born that way um that went along with the crowd mm -hmm. you know it's like, it's like never i never understood the same where i mean granted when i was really young maybe i did where it's like well you know you've heard your parents like if a million people jumped off a bridge would you go with them and it's like no i wouldn't that sent but then as i got older I understood it's like yeah there's a lot of people that would jump off that bridge <laughs> because they want to they want to go with the crowd uh, a perfect example would be uh, not to go off into this too much but it would be the whole mask wearing thing whereas once we hit once we hit a certain percentage the um the mask was uh, people went people i know a lot of people that just put on the mask because it was less hassle they didn't want to be the only person in the grocery store places that weren't required they wore the mask just because they uh they're for, you know the, the, the all the people around them they want to fit in it's weird we want to be individuals but we want to fit in um sorry one one second hold hold your thought for one second i hear a cat sure a no cat, cat. <laughs> one second. yeah no problem well uh hopefully you can still hear me there mark if not i'll get you caught up when you come back uh here to the screen uh the idea of this message, anybody who's watching this at the moment, the idea of this video, rather, is I want to get into the idea of the way people think. And so this has been helpful for me to listen to Mark uh, give some indication here. We were talking about claims and evidence. Uh, when Mark returns to the screen, uh, I, I promise, by the way, if you're curious why I'm not editing this out, I said I'm going to put an unedited video. So I want to leave this unedited there. So we'll- I'm back, okay I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. There you go. So, so what, I was just, what I was just saying to anybody who might be listening here, uh, a couple of things you brought up are actually on my mind. And so I want to bounce a couple yeah, of yeah. questions off you. You brought up science, you mentioned science. And so I want to posit for you uh, yeah. what I think is a key difference uh, between the scientific process and um, and the uh, well, frankly, flat flat, flat Earth uh, <laughs> approach to science that I saw on behind the curve and, and other examples as well. Uh, you said to me, uh, essentially, if I and again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. What it sounds like is one that you said that there is many ways not much of a distinction between a claim and, and evidence, but also you went on to say uh, that essentially you are looking for that pattern. You're looking for a way to make sense of things. Right. So in, in the process of science. Uh, just as you said, science is true until it's not. And I think the reason for that is in, in, in the process of science, we are attempting to falsify claims. We try to prove something is true right. by seeking ways to falsify it. We, if we can prove it false, science right. advances because now we've demonstrated that our hypothesis is incorrect. And so right. now we're moving forward. What seems to me to be the case is what you're describing sounds like the opposite direction. Um, instead of saying, I've got this hypothesis, I have this idea, and so I'm going to pursue some rigorous testing to determine whether or not that is a false claim or whether we need to amend our view, what it sounds as if is if you are looking to truify it. We have this idea, and so I'm going to do some experiments to prove that it's true. And so, for example, if you go looking for a pattern, if you go yeah. looking for a conspiracy, is it possible you'll find one because that's what you're looking for? In in some cases, yes, you, you're right. And when it when it comes to some cases, yeah, I am I am looking to connect the dots. Absolutely. A um, little different though with flat Earth. In that, again, everybody that got into the the whole flat Earth thing went in just again hating it. It's like no no no, I'm going to shoot it down. And when they tried to shoot it down, that's when they started having problems. Uh, again, I was not you know I made the clues, and there was a lot of things they didn't talk about in the documentary for obvious reasons because they didn't they did not want to shine us in in any sort of good light which was one of the first things was the whole long distance photography thing by far and away one of one of our the biggest things people do and i did not even suggest it in the clues people just started running to the beach with high definition cameras which is one of the big game changers and in the process again of trying to shoot it down they have a hard time okay let me rephrase this Again, all other conspiracies, yeah, what, what you're saying there is, is very, very much like that. But with, with okay. Flat Earth, it's kind, of, it's kind of like this. We treat it like a court case in that, can I prove to you the, the Flat Earth right now? Can, can I absolutely prove it? No. However, I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of Flat Earth model. And it's got a kind of an ethereal quality to it, but that's how everyone goes down the road. Everyone starts going, oh no, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to prove the globe. I'm going to prove the globe. And they keep trying to prove it. And this, there's these loose ends that just keep these nagging loose ends that keeps, keep popping up. And by the time they're done, I mean, there's this weird flipping process to where it's like, you know, kind of like me. I, mean, I was really stubborn. I mean, it took me nine months. And then finally I was like, you know what? I'm going the other way. It's flat. And, and then again, the internet hive mind, which I am a huge believer in, you know, the internet, people are stupid, <laughs> but, but it's kind of the opposite of men in black line. Whereas like people on the internet, the, the, the cumulative knowledge is very, very good. And so that's why I went to him. I said, okay, show me where I'm wrong. And mm -hmm. not enough people, the majority of people that are coming at me. were saying, no, 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 it's not. So with, with, you're right with other conspiracies. Yes. For me, I'm trying to connect the dots. With Flat Earth, I absolutely was not. I did not in any way whatsoever. I had a, my, I liked my life the way it mm -hmm. was. Uh, in fact, that's literally the first paragraph of the, the book I wrote, which I said, look, if you like your life, you know, what's the line? Uh, if you got a good bead on things, don't look at this because <clears throat> you, you, there's a point of no return. And right, if you right. get past this certain point, you can't come back from it because, again, kind of like the Matrix thing, you, mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing to come back from. You know, and I hear that's helpful for me to hear. And that, uh, that's, that's really what I think I'm trying to get at. We live in this age nowadays, um, in a lot of ways, you know, there's, you mentioned yourself, there's already been conspiracies around for a long time, but now especially uh, uh, conspiracy ideas are getting a lot of prominence and coverage in the media. And so right. to, that's kind of what I'm getting at with conspiracy thinking. And so I mentioned that we weren't necessarily going to debate specific claims. And so I appreciate that you made a distinction between yeah. uh, flat earth and experimentation and conspiracy theories in general. Yeah. You said a couple interesting things, and if it's okay, I want to ask some follow-up questions here. Yeah, you mentioned yeah, yeah. Uh, that with many conspiracies, you are trying to connect the dots. And so right. um, I guess uh, I, I do not want to conflate. I know that there are differences here. I don't want to uh, send the signal that every conspiracy is on equal footing and that everyone – you know, Oh, I'm no, sure no, there, no. There are people in the flat earth community who would, be, uh, who would not like to be connected to QAnon, and there are people in the QAnon community who do not want to be connected to flat earth. So that's not yeah. what I'm suggesting. Right, right, but right. Generally speaking with conspiracies, there's a few things I noticed. When we were talking about the movie a little while ago, Behind the Curve, yeah. uh, you used some language, and I, I'm curious. I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot about the language you used, but I noticed that you said protagonist and that you framed the scientist as the antagonist. Right. And it, what, what that reminds me of. Now, you might have just been talking from the story of the film. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here. Uh, there's, a, there's an idea out there that conspiracies – they give us the ability to kind of be the hero in the story. I'm, yeah. I'm the one that has figured out the truth. I'm the one that can see through the lies. You mentioned the Matrix. I've taken the red pill. I've become awakened. Right. So I just, I'm curious, with, with these conspiracy ideas, th does that give you comfort? Do you find yourself feeling like the protagonist in the story when you are engaging these ideas? Uh... Well, but when I was mentioning the protagonist, I was actually referring to the film because I'm, I, I, I thought so. Yeah, yeah pop, pop, pop culture. I have a big believer in storyline. Uh, as of a matter course, of fact, of course, uh, absolutely. Better I, more I'm than not, anything. Not any oh no, 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 no. It's okay. Yeah. The, but but that's a good point to to make because the writing is so important, and I apply that to everything. Meaning, I when I look at something, I look at plot holes. I look at I look at the plot holes in just about everything, including conspiracies, and I look. Okay, is it a good? Does the story make sense? You know, because if if you treat it like a boat, you know, if there's if like a story ship, if there's too many plot holes, the the story sinks, and which is why the we stop watching films. It's like ah, I don't even watch this. You're not invested anymore. Suspension of disbelief is is a very pow powerful thing. Um, do most conspiracy people though no, they don't see themselves as the hero. Now they may see themselves kind of as the matrixy thing, and there's a lot of matrix reference in conspiracies, of course. Right. Um, but it's they don't necessarily want to do that. It's a bittersweet thing because kind of like the matrix, because once you get into the conspiracy world, you realize the world is that you know the again pop culture references the candy coated topping. <laughs> there's something else underneath it. You know, we're shown one, you know, one thing again, ignorance is bliss, but you know, what's underneath it isn't exactly the greatest stuff to look at. And so it kind of darkens your mood. You feel like, oh yeah, I, I may know more, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, but it's also darkened it. So um, let, let me throw out one more thing at you real quick, because the, uh, sure. I was, I was thinking this one part of your earlier thing, we were talking about, um, 
about evidence and how things play out. And I was th thinking about, you know, conspiracies love on equal footing, right? And one of the conspiracies, you know, one of the ones people joke about, you know, like the Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. And I go, oh, Loch Ness Monster, really? So are there plesiosaurs swimming around Loch Ness? Is it possible that that some dinosaurs survived, you know, the um, the whole extinction stuff that was happening? And if they, if they were, chances are they were gonna be waterborne anyway. And people say, no, Loch Ness Monsters have been dead for, for 100 million years. I go, really? So I go, look at the coelacanth fish. You know, most people don't, don't realize it was an, it's an ugly fish, fossilized, uh, dead at least 70 million years. You can look it up, C-O-E-L-C-A-N-T-H. Sure. And lots of extra fins, very unattractive fish. Mm -hmm. Every scientist in the world, super dead, super extinct, gone. Here's the fossil records, blah, 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 carbon dating, blah, blah, blah. It's mm -hmm. like... Okay, and then the British caught one uh, in a net off of um, Madagascar, and then another one off Mozambique, and then another one off of South Africa, and then National Geographic finally caved in and they started swimming with them. So the question is, you know, I, I won't we'll get into exactly how scientists got, every scientist in the world would have bet the farm on it, and they would have been absolutely 100% put it in a frame wrong. Mm -hmm. But the, the question is, um, it, then, then you come back with circle back, and I say, I ask you again, I say, is Loch Ness Monster possible? And they said, well, no. I go, why? Because it's been dead for at least 100 million years. I go, no, there's that fish over there, and that's not dead anymore. It's, it's very much alive. So how do you know? Um, it goes into the whole cryptozoology thing, which I love so much. Everything that scientists said or that they discovered later was initially a myth, especially when it comes to um, animals. You know, the giant panda, total myth. Oh, then they have found one giant anaconda total myth giant squid which we still have never caught one of the big ones never ever caught one of the big ones the only reason we know they're alive is because the sperm whales which eventually have to surface have huge track marks in some of their beaks and their stomachs sure but we will never be able to catch one because they're they dive deeper than our and are faster than our best subs we will never ever be able to catch one mm -hmm. so they're not a myth anymore so sorry. So when it comes to qualifiers, it's really weird. Um, the Bigfoot thing, people it's like, well, Bigfoot's you know, there's no way Bigfoot could be real. I go, eh, in 2015 they caught the Billy Ape. But people don't know about that. It's like it was a six foot tall chimp down a whole species of them down South America. Sure, sure. That are really, really gun shy of humans, and it's like they were just like, yeah, humans don't go anywhere near them. And so they kept far, far away. And it's like, why didn't we catch them until 2015? I, I guarantee you, by the way, sorry, one more thing real fast. I believe there is a species of this straight out of the movies, but I believe it because there are conspiracy whispers of it out there of something I like to call the Goliath Cobra. I think there's a species of snake out there that's really, really big and really, really fast. And, you know, it's, it scales up like, you know, it's basically a giant cobra with a, the head the size of a horse. But when an explorer finds it, he doesn't get to log it <laughs> because like, oh, wow, this is really, ah, you know, and then he's dead. You know, I think there's species of, of things we find out there that are lost in the course of exploration. And anyway, so. As I said, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm not, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, someone listening to this might be irritated that I'm not addressing any specific claim. Again, what I'm getting no, at no, here no, is, no. is the ahead. way of thinking. Um, I on some level, I agree with you, Mark, uh, this idea that things may be possible. But here's the thing. As a skeptic, yeah. I take, I, I make a distinction between the possible and the actual. And so to me, to be, a, to be a skeptic would be uh, to, to, uh, to accept a claim once it's been justified. So your example about the Loch Ness Monster, is it possible that the Loch Ness Monster could exist? Sure. But then I, do, as a skeptic, do not then say, therefore, my assertion is the Loch Ness Monster exists. And so, God, no, the same and, way and I would say, is it, is it possible that Mark Sargent stuffs cotton candy up his nose? Well, no, no. And I, and I understand that. No, trust sure. me. I, I've, I've met plenty of people that it's basically, unless the Loch Ness Monster pops up and slaps you in the face, nope, it's not, well, you know. My, my standard of evidence might be a little lower than getting slapped in the face by him, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> he doesn't no, have to turn I, up I know what you mean. If he slaps but, me in the face, I'll take him to court that'll show <laughs> <laughs> no no i get it no and, and trust me i am i am a big open-minded um a leap of faith type of guy and and mm -hmm. we you know the, okay. flat earth is is and i'm really surprised they didn't do this in the movie but and journalists haven't really touched on it much which is why hasn't flat earth been painted more as a cult because we we do use a lot of religious terms you know, leaps of faith and believers and non-believers. You know, we don't have a Bible and robes and chanting or anything like that. Mm -hmm. but, but we do use a lot. I mean, I suppose if we had a compound somewhere in Oregon, we'd be in trouble. 
<laughs> but but we do do conferences and stuff like that, and and yeah. the media has tried to to go down that road. But yes, there. For me, it, the the big difference between a skeptic and a non skeptic, I think, is is you know I'm willing to make those those leaps of faith. Why you know why do I make them more than other people? Is it because of my religious background? Maybe, maybe. But mm -hmm. I was I was away from the church for I don't remember the last decade I was in church, other than weddings or funerals. So I don't know. But but it's it yeah. it most of it is a leap of faith. Absolutely. Sure. That, that is uh, helpful. That's exactly what I'm getting at in this interview. I'm hoping to learn about the way you think, and I'm getting a lot of valuable insights here by listening to you. I want to come back to this faith idea in a minute, because you mentioned religious thinking, and I want to come back to that. Um, yeah. I, I have another uh, thing I want to bounce off you about conspiracies. One of them was I asked if if uh, if if uh, you might feel like you are the protagonist or hero, and it sounds like sometimes you say people might feel as if that's the case, but that might just be a consequence of when you're reading these theories, some of the uh, some of the uh, perceived conspirators are just kind of dark figures, and so it might just be in contrast to that. Yeah. Um, my, my second uh, thought here is a lot of times conspiracies, in my mind, uh, are quite simple answers. And here's what I mean by that. I don't mean they're not intricate, because boy, are they detailed. I have seen the Q map of all these ideas. I've seen you know intricate explanations for, uh, yeah. for uh, how the Earth uh, works in, in a flat model, for example. So it's not that they're not detailed or that they're not intricate. What I'm saying is, we take a very complex, big, changing world, and we have, uh, we, uh, it feels comforting, or there's some security sometimes if we feel like we have a simple answer for it. So for example, why is the Panama Canal in existence? Because they, there was a conspiracy. And why, right. uh, why is it that the earth is flat, but many people think it's round? So in other words, we find this one size fits all answer. Everything can go back to this conspiracy there's this they this force out there that yeah. in some way is conspiring to to mislead us and so i guess right. i ask you is is the idea of some of these conspiracy ideas is that comforting to you is this something that you find gives you an uh, an element of uh, of control in the world or a sense of comfort or security knowing that you have uh, an answer for it um with uh, that's yeah it's kind of a mixed bag but i'll i'll do the best i can there okay. the with all other conspiracies, it's actually the opposite. You, as you learn about conspiracies, you realize how much control you don't have in the world. Um, <clears throat> and even knowing the information doesn't really help you, especially when you know there are groups out there. Uh, you know, f the pecking order. Who knows? You know, everything from you know the the top ones in the conspiracy world would be I don't know the Illuminati, the Bilderbergs, the Rothschilds. The Vatican, the Council for Foreign Relation, uh, the Trilaterals, the Masons, blah, blah, blah. It right, goes on and on. Right. Knowing that those groups are out there um, doesn't bother me so much, but there's a lot of people that's like, oh, you know, again, they're making decisions without my consent. They're making decisions that affect my life. Um, so, no, it doesn't make their the effect. Again, with the conspiracy world, it kind of weighs on you. Because you're like, oh, you know, there's these forces out there that are incomprehensibly powerful compared to me. Um, but again, the, the whole flat earth thing, though, the reason why it resonated as well as it did, uh, it still is, is because it's, simp it's a simple way to describe something that has just gotten more and more complex over the decades. Meaning... And again, it's, it's science people push back on me because I say, look, we've basically created a model of the universe that is way easier to explain exponentially easier to explain than uh the solar system model you know the solar system models takes uh trigonometry and calculus and quantum mechanics and all the other stuff mm -hmm. and the flat earth model is very very simple i mean very very simple it's basically a snow globe and people and, and you say well just because simple doesn't mean it's right i go no but it's easier to understand and you get to remember the audience the masses out there <clears throat> And I don't want to necessarily call them mouth-breathing troglodytes, but the masses out there are very easy. Like I mean, reality television, which I hate, <laughs> is a big thing, and yet people are you know they they eat it up. So, but but yeah, I mean, sorry, the easier, go sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say that, that's I think what I was getting at. You said. Uh, the flat Earth model is simple and it's easy to understand. And so I guess yep. my question is, do you derive comfort, uh, a sense of security or comfort from the idea that I, I understand things? I have a model I understand now. And so because it's simple and easy to understand, that's comforting to me. Well, yeah, yeah. But that really only applies to the flat Earth when it comes to conspiracies, because not only, yeah, not only do I understand it, but it's easy to understand. 
Meaning it's it's not this, you know, you're not we're not talking about millions of light years. We're not talking about vast, you know, pulsars and gamma bursts and all this other stuff that could wipe you out at any any given time, that you're this mm -hmm. tiny little rock that could be snuffed out. Um, that you are literally living in a building, a structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And again, we might as well get into this eventually, um, that uh, that it was built. Because if it's not an organic, quote unquote, an organic structure, then it was built by somebody. And <clears throat> at that point, you're, you're going into, because at least half of our membership, at least in the United States, and probably, well, just about every English speaking country, are made up of um, very strong Christians. Because why, you know, if it was created, then it was created by someone. And at that point, you're really only going down one of two roads, one of two forks, which is um, it's either an advanced civilization that's older and more powerful than ourselves or the divine, but really are kind of split in hairs there. I mean, let's face it, if a golden spaceship lands in Paris one day, but two, and, and, you know, there's going to be two groups of people that are going to show up, you know, that's like, like it's like oh wow giant blue people they are like avatar all the nerds and then you have other people it's like we have to build a church immediately for the blue people and that will you know and then you've got these two different camps and so yeah i mean it's but yeah it's a faith faith is a very very powerful thing and there's a lot of christians that jumped on this and not just christians all all religions kind of jumped on this but the christians at least in the united states really really jumped on it but I, I'm seeing some similarities there with uh, with other conspiracy ideas. I mean, frankly, there are many, many pastors out there who are preaching about QAnon. There are many pastors out there that you mentioned a variety of groups yeah. uh, a moment ago, uh, the Bilderberg, so on and so forth, yeah, all yeah. these different uh, groups. Um, and, and I know you made a distinction there between other conspiracy theories and flat earth, uh, yeah. but what we've created there in those other conspiracy theories is we always have an enemy. There is a them that is responsible for all yeah. this. And so, so what I meant by simplicity is not that they're detail that the details of the conspiracies are not complex. Like I said, I've seen that Q uh, map there where they have all those things. Tied that is definitely complex. A lot yeah. of intricate intricate ideas. But what we've done now is we've created a boogeyman, if you will. There is yeah. someone behind the curtain that we can blame for. We can say there's a mass shooting, and ah, they are behind it. And we can say there are some wildfires. They must have set them. And yeah. So, uh, and so I guess that's what I'm getting at. Is, is yeah, is, yeah. Is, let me let me address that real quick. Which is yeah. there's a new term that's been only out for I don't know less than a couple of years now, which is called auto hoaxing. And basically what's happened is there's so, because of social media and because the internet is so webbed and so, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, so intricate that if there's conspiracies here, then everything must be a conspiracy. Meaning now the default state, it's, you know, it's, it's now guilty until proven innocent. Meaning, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, oh, I, do I think there's legitimate shootings? Yeah, you bet I do. Not every shooting, you know, is a false flag operation. Not every, and QAnon, uh, I think that is cultivated by, you know, different groups because it's, they're awfully quiet this year, which is really weird. But yeah, let me do the whole they versus them, you know, us versus them. Forget about that big map that you saw, which is sure, unbelievably sure. complex. It comes down to... Uh, the haves and the haves and have nots. That's all it's ever been. That is a timeless story going back forever. And that is, if you have a huge, the, the literally the golden rule, you know it. He who has the gold makes the rules. It's not just that. If you have the gold, you can bend or break the rules. You can make up whatever you want. And the rules also don't apply to you. Mm -hmm. If you if you have if you reach a certain level, and I'm not talking about new money. I'm talking about Bill Gates. I'm talking about people old money. You know, guys like Elon Musk and Gates and and um, oh, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, uh, Mark Cuban. Th those guys, are, those are new money by comparison. They still have to follow the rules. And so people at the higher levels, yeah. they. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. There has to be an adversary out there. It is, does have to be an us versus them scenario because, well, at the very least, you're talking about, you know, class distinction. And we're not talking about just upper class. We're talking about, you know, the, the one percenters, not the 10 percenters, the one percenters. And that is people. It's it's one of the one of the seven, you know, one of the deadly sins, which is envy. We, we covet, we envy and we are jealous. We are infinitely jealous. It, you know, it, not necessarily me, but uh, lots of people. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I have a boat. He has a bigger boat. I have a plane. He's got five planes. And when you get up to certain levels, it's like when they're when they're unreachable, when you know there is not a chance in hell you are getting up to that pinnacle, you hate them. 
you look at it, you know, we, and we do this with everything on a micro level. We do this with celebrities. How many times do we see it? We build up celebrities and we love it when they fall. We, we love celebrities to get to certain power, but don't get, too, don't get too egotistical. Don't get too full of yourself because then we're going to hate you. And then when you fall, we're going to laugh. We're going to laugh. We get satisfaction out of it. Sorry. Yeah, a variety of ideas in there. That's very helpful. Again, what I'm trying to get is some insights into the way. If, if I could restate what I'm hearing about some patterns in, in terms of the way that you might think. One of them you mentioned earlier, uh, that a central idea of when you're thinking of these conspiracies and considering them, it's about if you can make sense of them, if you can put it together, if you can connect the dots. Yeah. What I, if I may draw a, a, another principle out of what you've just described, you said there must be an adversary, this idea of us versus them. Now, you reframed it as the haves and have-nots, but yeah. this idea that there are us and them, that that is also central uh, to your, uh, your, I guess, your worldview, your way of looking at things, that there, ha there, is, there is an adversary behind this, you're saying. For me, it's not necessarily an adversary. It is mm -hmm. there are people in power that make decisions that you have no literally no part of whatsoever where it's outside of at least in the united states outside of the democratic process you mm -hmm. you don't have a vote you don't have a say and i've even taken it so far where i've told people i go look at the voting at the federal level in this country worthless utter worthless and they say why i go because here here's i pose a question to them i go let's say you're a billionaire right now and the election's coming up who do you donate money to and then you go through this big decision process. Why well, go? Am I pro this? Am I against this? You know, pro. It, there's all sorts of different things. And I go, no, you're missing the point. The point is, is that you give money to both parties. And this is also timeless, you know, politicking, which is you give money to both parties because both parties don't care. All they care about is if, if they get the check. They don't care if you wrote a check to the other guy. They just care if they got their check. And if you have a billion dollars, if you donate a million dollars, you can, you will absolutely get your picture taken with the president, right? And if you donate $10 million, you can sit in on some meetings. A hundred million dollars, you know, you might even be able to influence a little bit of policy, some, some rules here and there. And he was like, what's your point? My point is, is that it took you being a billionaire to do any influence over anything at all. As a common general public, what are you getting out of this? And again, I'm not trying to be disparaging or discouraging. It's like, look, that's just the way of the world. Well, I, but, I am a billionaire, so I didn't mention that. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so sorry, sorry. I, 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 you made some, well, I keep uh, you on track. No, 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 of course. You made some interesting observations there about power dynamics. The idea that there are yeah. people who are making decisions that are beyond our control. Yeah. Is that feeling of not having any control of being, uh, for lack of a better term, being helpless to change the course of some decisions that are made? Does that drive your uh, your thinking in explore, exploring conspiracy? Is there a connection yeah. between the patterns you find, a conspiracy you find, and a feeling of powerlessness or helplessness in in you? Not per not personally, um, okay. but but with a lot of people, absolutely. I mean, for a lot of people, and they we have thrown this term around a lot. They have thrown out that it's a form of slavery. And that is, you know, if you are being controlled without, you know, your consent at all, then isn't in that of some sort of form of slavery. It's like, yeah, but at the same time, you're, vo you're, you're volunteering it. I mean, you, you hire, you know, we, it, it scales up, meaning we hire elected officials and there's more and higher and higher and higher. And they also have jobs to do. But then we, you know, we kind of resent them at the same time. We, we elect people to do this. And when they don't do what we thought they were going to do, you know, the, the, the promise of election, right? You know, mm -hmm. like politicians make promises all the time. But at a certain level, there are no politics. And so does that make me feel personally that, you know, is out of control? No, that's just how I'm, I'm about as objective as it gets. This is how things work here. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I've seen it too many times. I've seen it in too... Again, if you're not married and have or have kids and you live as long as I am, you absorb way too much media. But I've just seen too many, you know, I've seen the patterns where it's like, yeah, that's just how things work. People in power make decisions and the people that don't have power resent them some of the time. But you remember, a lot of people, the majority, the masses go along with it. The majority are just absolutely fine with it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, everything's good. Everything's everything's good. And then there's a smaller sector. But so when like this year rolled around, you see more conspiracy people because things aren't as pleasant as they were last year. Mm -hmm. How's that? Yeah. Is um, 
Uh, is science a reliable path to discovering truth in your mind? The scientific process is that a oh yeah 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 no sci so I love the scientific method absolutely I know I'm and people people will say oh aren't you anti science not that many people will say it but they do say it every once in a while I go no of course not I love I look I grew up in the tech world <laughs> I love science I love cutting edge everything do I think we go too far sometimes sure but that's the nature of science science is notorious for doing things because they can. Not because they should. Um, there was that great line from the uh, the documentary um, Trinity and Beyond, where they were talking about you know should they go jump up from the atomic bomb to the hydrogen bomb, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And you know one of the leading physicists was going, yeah, you know he he was foreign guy, but he was basically saying they built it because let's just see if we can build it, right? Mm -hmm. And like forget about you know the ramifications of this. Let's see if we can build it. And because that's what science does, you know, they try to be as a, you know, they don't, they don't look at the, the, the crisis of conscience mm -hmm. when, when they're doing that. And so, yeah, science is a, is a great path to do things, but science, but people forget, and again, the general public, if you put on a white lab coat and you make a statement, you have almost instant credibility, almost instant people's like, well, it's smarter than I am. So we've got to go along with what he says. It's like, look, science is corruptible as anybody else. I can give you a laundry list of, of projects that have, they have cut corners and straight out lied to make quarterly profits, to make, you know, to make the stock go up. Because look, scientists need Porsches too. You know, they're, they're going to take the money. So are, you, so are you saying science is a reliable method to, uh, by which we can discover truth, but scientists cannot be trusted? Would that be a fair restatement of what you've said? Yes, yeah, sci science objectively as a, as a methodology mm -hmm. is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But people, especially men, men are corruptible. Doesn't matter where you are. I don't care what profession you are in. I don't care if you're wearing a lab coat or not. You can be corrupted and often are. Now, are some scientists, are they objective? Sure. But the difference is, and maybe it's the whole money thing, uh, capitalism changed all that, uh, which is, I mean, come on. We, we make products and we make things because we, you know, it, and we rush them to market. That's, that's one of the big things, you know, I, I rattle off real fast. Um, lead paint was a great idea. <laughs> lead gasoline, not really seeing a lot of those anymore. I uh, basically anything with lead. DDT, all the variations of DDT. <clears throat> asbestos, a wonderful product, actually. I actually believe in asbestos. Great, and we still use it today. Unless you work in the factory, oh my God, we st those television commercials are still out there. Uh, all of the, the scientists that use, or that took the money and said that cigarettes were absolutely fine for you. You know, things happen so what it, there's an old saying which is um trust everyone but count your change which is like look you trust science but don't absolutely just give it to them you know don't the science which is why we do a lot of stuff ourselves especially in the flat earth community it's like look a lot for a lot of us it's like unless we can run the experiment ourselves there's only so much credit we're going to give you um uh, real quick which is um if you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level, yeah, yeah, I can do do that right now. Sure. You want to tell me what the core of the Earth looks like? Oh no, not not so fast. No, 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 because those diagrams, remember, they're just illustrations, right? You know, four thousand miles of the center. You know, those wonderfully perfectly segmented bands. You know, red and orange and yellow and white. And the deepest hole ever drilled was eight miles. Where, where the hell are you getting those bands from? And they've been there forever. And they, again, science makes these massive leaps of faith and they put their statements out there and they say, well, this is what we think it is. But then they take out the think part and they say, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there should be literally the globe should be just a giant question mark on the inside of it. If you believe, you know, if you believe in the globe, but that's not what they put. In fact, in this fine print and wiki, they'll say, oh, no, we have absolutely no idea what's going on down there. We're just extrapolating from volcanoes. It's like, why didn't you say that then? And while you're at it, why are you give me the cross section of Jupiter and Neptune and all that? Why are you give me the cross section of anything? So no, I mean science. Yeah, sorry. Short version: science is a methodology. Wonderful people, <laughs> super corruptible, and women get a pass for the most part. Yeah. Well, no comment on that. I'll leave that. I'll leave that comment to you. Uh, I'll say. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with your characterization of, of science as being a leap of faith or that the, I, I'm not sure that the, the level of confidence, I think there are varying levels of confidence based on the justifications we have on various yes. claims. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 you're right. No, no, of course. On its own merit. But uh, something that you said uh, uh, 
interests me there. It, it, you were mentioning various examples in the past of when uh, when the prevailing thought or when science has been wrong. You gave some examples in the past of things like yeah. leaded paint, things like that. Yeah, it, it's almost as if you were phrasing that as as um, not necessarily a negative thing, but as, as as a demonstration that science is is not necessarily always trustworthy. I would argue that's the strength of the scientific approach that we have a we can point to changes in our practices and changes as new knowledge came about we Ooh. we stopped doing things that were harmful and we have improved our beliefs and we have so to me the idea that you can point to a trail of mistakes or a, a, a trail of uh, misconceptions or poor ideas in the past to me that's a strength because that demonstrates to me that we have improved by changing our mind so my you, question you know what to that's you is, that's a, well, that's oh, a sorry, good go point you respond to that i'll be no no, no nobody has ever brought that that angle up to me and that's good i actually like that because you're you're right and, I, and i'm not trying to paint it exactly a negative light i know look yeah. science brought us to where we are today but at the same time what i'm trying to tell people is look do your own research and and do you know don't trust everything completely uh, absolutely implicitly based on just because well it came from the world of science therefore it absolutely must be true one of the most arrogant statements i ever heard and i know where he was going he probably just worded it wrong was from um neil degrasse tyson where he says that science is true whether or not you believe in it and it's like yeah you probably should have phrased that differently because what you're saying there is that science is absolutely true but i know that's not what he meant he uh, yes things do change you're right things do get adjusted but usually only after something bad happens you know or it's like oh this is absolutely great we should move forward with this and then all of a sudden something terrible happens and it's like yeah well science doesn't the Again, I'm not picking on science or scientists necessarily, but it's, it's just one of the flaws in the system, which is science rarely, if ever, apologizes for anything mm -hmm. because they is like, well, that's just what it is. Kind of like the, um, oh, what? Uh, let's use a positive one. The double slit experiment, which I love so much, uh, which is, you know, things don't apparently render as detailed as they can unless you're looking at them. And science can't explain it in any way, shape or form. But since it's repeatable, it's under the banner of science. It's under the umbrella of science. I'm going, it's like, oh, this is us. This is science. We plant our flag in this. It's like, it's freaking magic. And, you know, by all, you know, all standards, it's like, so why are you putting our science? Because it's repeatable. All right, fine. <laughs> it's like, you know, but I would say, I hear what you're saying, but I, yeah. I would say those same scientists, yeah. something is accepted because it's been repeatable and testable and provable. But if new information came to light, that yes. refuted that, I would yeah. say that scientists would then change the theory. My they question would. to they you... Would. They would move yeah. the flag. Sure. You're right. absolutely right. Exactly. It, it's, it's, it's a bittersweet thing for me because, again, it, I, I'm not... Trust me when I say this. I don't hate scientists. I don't. Sure, um, sure, because sure. I've, there's so very few that I ha that I get to deal with. But let me let me throw out one real quick. There's very few in the, in the physicist world. There's only three media scientists that are even out there. Um, they're even willing to go, they even put on camera, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox from England, and Michio Kaku from Japan. And some people say, oh, throw in Bill Nye. It's like, well, okay, there's your, there's your weird thing. Because Bill Nye, he's not a scientist. He's actually um, a, a comedian from a, a, stand, a comedy troupe in Seattle. But he got, he, but somebody said, oh yeah, put you, you're thin, you're angular, put on a lab coat. And they did this little thing called Bill Nye the Science Guy. He was not a science guy in any way, shape or form. He's got a bachelor's in mechanical and he, he completely ditched that to do acting. But because he looks credible on camera, the media kept putting him on for different things. And because nobody bothered to check any of that, he kept, he gets brought on for, oh my God, let's talk about climate change with Bill Nye. Let's talk about quantum mechanics. Let's talk. He was a, he was a freaking advisor on the Mars Rover. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I watched this guy growing up on Seattle television. He was, you know, you see the skits he was on. It was like, but the, because media has become so powerful in the conditioning of media, he, um, he because he was syndicated disney picked him up because he was family friendly because he was syndicated people grew up with him and now those people some of those people are producers and those producers like because the general scientists sorry not i gotta get this out there sure. general scientists for whatever reason when you get your master's or your phd in a physical science you start losing vocabulary i don't know why you start talking in monosyllables you, you know you're very very tunnel vision it's like yes that is true and producers hate that so they bring on bill bill just you know let it fly and and talk about stuff and people people at home it's like oh yeah i remember him 
from when I was on PBS when I was growing up. Therefore, he is credible. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, a, I, I have a, a rant on my channel literally called the Code of Credibility. Literally, it's mm -hmm. called that. And it literally yeah. says if you're wearing a white lab coat, you are inside. Uh, we've done this. We have had people, we have put our guys in white lab coats with clipboards. It's amazing how many more people will talk to you if you are in white lab coats and clipboards. What, yeah, what you're describing is a logical fallacy called the argument from authority. If someone if someone is believing something because an authority has told them, uh, then yes, that is a bad reason to believe. But my, my uh, uh, contention would be, we yeah. don't necessarily believe something because Bill Nye said it. We don't necessarily believe something because Neil deGrasse Tyson is the guy that said it. I would say, as a skeptic, we accept claims when there's justification, and we also have a willingness to revise our ideas or our claims when new information comes to light. So I hear what you're saying, but what, what you're describing is a real thing. But people yeah. have this tendency, you know, that back in the day you talk about cigarettes, they would say nine out of ten doctors agree that this cigarette is good for you. Yeah. That's a fallacy. That's a bad reason to believe something <laughs> because you've got you you're you're relying on the prettiness of a lab coat to make that point. So yeah, I guess yeah. I, I mean, I, we, is, yeah, we we have yeah. learned from our mistakes. I mean, we don't sell heroin and cocaine in drugstores anymore. Um, it's true. We, yeah. we don't sell machine guns to the general public in hardware stores anymore. We used to. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff we don't do anymore. Uh, we have learned, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. through trial My question to you would be, uh, I, I'm not trying to speed the conversation along, but I know you yeah, have yeah. other things to do. I want to respect your time here. What, what yeah. would change your mind? Uh, let's just start with one claim, with the flat earth claim. What would change your mind? Uh, two things. I, I, get, I get asked this every once in a while. Um, mm -hmm. There are two things that could be done. One is kind of expensive. <laughs> uh, one isn't. One would be um, put any camera... 4k or higher on a, a capsule of any rocket that's going to leave orbit point mm -hmm. it down towards the launch pad launch it you know send it off and eventually you know don't hit pause don't hit edit don't you dare you know don't deviate from it in any way shape or form and eventually the world should form into this wonderful globe as this thing leaves um it's never happened in the history of space travel which is statistically f unbelievable to me that's that'd be the easiest way to do it and let us get so, a hold so of the, the ex existing photos existing videos from space th those ones you can see as being absolutely fake in, 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 inadmissible okay so no how no you... nothing yeah nothing until until we have decent footage where we can actually look at it where where you want to cut shot to space come on we we know full well what can be faked in film. We've been doing it since oh two thousand one, a space odyssey, which still it has aged amazingly well on Blu ray. I challenge anybody watch when they were when they're flying to the moon in that, and that's from sixty eight. That's from a flick. long a time movie. ago. Yeah. It is gorgeous. So and so then, look, so then can, I'm curious why why your your reason for changing your mind would be additional footage. Could that footage? Not oh, be because fixed? because there's there's one piece of footage that's never ever happened. For, for, okay. You know, anyone can do cut shots of anything. You know, we've seen this from Interstellar and Gravity and just about every space movie that's ever happened. But mm -hmm. we've never seen, uh, literally it's never seen a piece of footage where the rocket, where literally it's pointing down. It's always on the first stage or the second stage, coincidentally, and they just tumble off. It's like, oh, okay, or they cut to graphics. It's like once it gets out of visual range, you know, of whatever, it's like, oh, here's the computer model of exactly what's happening. It's like, we don't want to see that. We want to see the footage of the thing forming. And it should have absolutely happened, by the way, during the um, uh, the Roadster in space, that whole SpaceX Roadster in space thing, oh, which I don't right. even want to get into. Um, that, that's I, I the... Think I was going to say, I think I interrupted you. You said two things. You said one was the camera. I didn't mean to. Yeah, one was the camera. That's 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 harder to do because you're going to have to find a rocket program to do it. But I came up with an easier one to do, okay. which is what I call the Spacesuit Challenge, which is, uh, in fact, I made a video specifically for it on my channel called the, um, uh, oh, crap, For Want of a Nail? Was that what it was? Uh, crap. Oh, no, no, The Lost Nail. That's what it's called. The lost nail. I don't know if you remember the old, uh, is it a proverb or just a thing where you, you heard for want of a nail, the shoe was lost, the, then the horse was lost, the rider, then the battle in the kingdom. And be, all, all the whole kingdom was lost because of one, you know, the, the butterfly effect, basically. Mm -hmm. And what I said was, is that the spacesuit cannot work the, the way it's supposed to. Um, it's one of the laws of thermodynamics, which is that pressure cannot exist in non pressure without a barrier. And anything that's put in a vacuum with any sort of flexibility, I don't care if it's a basketball, a football, a, a action figure, a Stretch Armstrong, they all blow, you know, a tin can, they all expand and they detonate. They blow up in a vacuum because the pressure difference is, is too great. There's only one thing that doesn't exhibit that property, uh, and that is a spacesuit. 
a spacesuit should turn into a parade float and then it should burst and someone it should die and it's absolutely articulate i mean you can move your elbows and legs your fingers can manipulate complex electronics none of that should happen whatsoever <laughs> and so my challenge was i said anything with a spacesuit in it if if the spacesuit is a lie then anything that ever shows a spacesuit or is tied to a spacesuit is also a lie so i said all right fine give me a loan me a spacesuit because we've never had anyone die in a spacesuit ever statistically really really interesting loan me a spacesuit from the 60s era up until now put me in any sort of university vacuum chamber pull the switch tell me what happens don't give me a G4 suit where I'm tethered. Give me the, the backpack version, you know, the, the self-contained. What is this miracle technology that's in the backpack of any spacesuit that stops the vacuum of space? No one will, no one will touch it. No one has any explanation. People say, oh, it's layers. It's going, no, no, no my, my winter coat has layers. All it does is stop the cold. So what, what happens there? So and I put that, I, that challenge has been out there for three years now. No one will touch it. And it's relatively cheap. By comparison, I mean, literally all you have to do is give me, you know, universities have vacuum chambers. Brian Cox has personal use to, to a vacuum chamber. Why, why has that ever happened? And does that, does that absolutely prove a flat earth? No, it does not. But it destroys the, uh, the whole space thing. You know, the whole, the whole idea of uh, the space program, especially in dealing with a vacuum chamber. Yeah, so my definition of a skeptic earlier was somebody who accepts claims with justification and then is willing to revise their views. If I'm hearing you correctly, you've got two specific objections, one being the lack of uh, any um, non-cut footage, footage. Yeah. one being uh, this objection about the spacesuit and uh, your, uh, the uh, apparent inability to survive under the conditions of space. Yeah. Uh, am I hearing you correctly that you're saying that evidence uh, that is, in your eyes, irrefutable in those areas, that those would be factors that would cause oh, you I'd, to Oh, I'd your quit. I'd, I'd absolutely quit. I have, I've told people, I go, look, I, people think that I'm really enjoying doing what I do. I do the whole flatter thing. It's like, no, 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 no. I didn't want to do this. You, you think I like getting... I don't even read the comments on YouTube anymore. I can't. I mean, I, I'd curl up in a field position and probably die. I mean, there's, it's just, I mean, it's awful. So no, I would absolutely quit Flat Earth tomorrow. Hmm. Um, in fact, if I, even if I had a subject matter expert that would call me up, every subject matter, I don't get a list of them, a playlist on my channel. Everybody from all, all branches of the military, um, engineers, air traffic controllers, everybody that has to do with shipping, everybody has told me the same thing. I, I, in fact, I even had, haven't had anyone from the military call me up to rebut the other military guys. Or a pilot to to call me to 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 go. I'm I'm look. Trust me when I say this. I'd love to to get out of this. And and mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, one more last last thing. Um, yeah. well, well, and you can have your last question, which is um, there was another challenge I put out there because people um say people say well I, you I, you know I've seen the curve from the airplane. I've seen it from a balloon. I've seen it from the beach. It's like well, I don't know. And yet Neil deGrasse Tyson, I've got a wonderful video on my channel where Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about the Red Bull jump, if you remember that, uh, the yeah. Felix Bumgarner thing. And it was really interesting. I was surprised that he even did this. He did this on stage at this uh, this conference, and he said that he thought it was um, scientifically irresponsible for the Red Bull jump to claim that they saw the curvature of the Earth. And he goes, 130,000 feet, you shouldn't be able to see any curvature whatsoever. It's like, wow, I wonder, wonder why, you would, why you would say that. And so when people say to me um, that they've seen the curvature from the airplane, I go, no, you're seeing five lights. And they say, what are you, what are you talking about? I go, oh, you know, the Orwell, five lights, four lights thing. I go, um, you're conditioned. You want to see the curvature. That's the big difference. You absolutely want to see it because you've been told this so many times. Last quote, because I, I know I've been giving you a lot of quotes. George Orwell. Uh, back in 1946, I believe, 1946, he wrote an article for London. He was not a flat earther, but it was really interesting. He was talking about, remember how, what you were talking about, how people believe science just because they say something. And he was saying, you could walk up to anybody in the street and you ask them how they know the world is a globe. And they'll say, and their first response is always, oh, pfft, I'm talking about, we know, it's obvious. It is known, Game of Thrones. It is known, right? Mm -hmm. When he, and then he goes, if you push them on it, they get angry because then they realize it's not that they know, it's been, they've been told. How did everybody in the world know the girl, world was a globe in 1946? NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. How did everybody know? They didn't know. That's because they were told. They were told in textbooks, just gone over and over and over again. There's no rocket programs. How do you know until you actually see it for yourself? And you, you, you can claim geometry all you want. Sorry, math isn't going to save you. Not in this case. Uh, the evidence is up there and then only only people who go up there are military 
So, sorry, I can talk about this no, forever. Don't need to apologize. I would say, uh, yeah, I, I've read that quote before. And again, that's one of those things that I personally tend to find, at least in my own belief system, actually to be a strength. If someone said to me uh, that you are not 100% sure of something, to me, the lack of 100% certainty, I think, is, is, a, is a blessing in a lot of ways because it invites us to question what our justifications are for believing something. And so, Agreed. Um, Agreed. And so, um, yeah, I know. I appreciate your time, and I, I don't uh, want to uh, keep you too much longer, but I just wanted you earlier, uh, you mentioned a connection to your faith and, and religious thinking. We don't yeah. have to go on a full uh, treatise here on this, but I just wanted to circle back to that here as yeah. we uh, start to wrap up our time. I know you've got other things. No, to no, do. that's fine. That's fine. We got in, in, your, in your mind, is there a connection between the Christian faith and a connection to conspiracy thinking? Do you think that this is something that is connected in some way? Um... If that's too big a question, the, to no, answer, no, no, no. I, I, I'll give you broad strokes because I honestly, I don't, I don't know too much. I mean, right wing politics tend to lean more Christian because of the whole, um, that, you know, abortion versus non-abortion thing. You know, sure. there's a lot more biblical literalists in the right on the right wing. And when, yeah, if you're right wing, you believe more in conspiracies. Definitely. In fact, I, I can tell you, I, the, the conferences I go to. There is not a lot of left there. Um, now, does you know when it came? However, when it came to the flat Earth and Christianity, more people, had, more people got. I've heard the story so many times where people that were falling away from the church came back to the church because of flat Earth. In fact, I have had people say that they've never seen a recruiting tool for religion more than the flat Earth because, again, the default shape. Which is, if it's a snow globe, then that snow globe was built by somebody. Plain and simple. And that's all it takes for some people to just nudge them back. And that was the same with me. Um, I didn't go, you know, I didn't go to church for a long, long time. And I still haven't really been to church. But my aspect, but it snapped me back into spirituality. Because hmm. it's like, okay, it was built. It was built by someone. Ancient civilization, maybe. You know, Santa Claus in a bathrobe on a Sunday, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, uh, but it's uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely a connection there um, between conspiracies and the church. But <laughs> Interesting. flat Earth, unfortunately, has cultivated that recently over the last five years. Definitely, mm. because again, it's, it's it's one of those reverse things where you go forward, and if you get into flat Earth, because it is so big, everything is under its umbrella. So you have to revisit everything you thought of before. It's like, wow, if flat Earth is true. Because and all this other the stuff, entire, the entirety of the system is entailed in this model, and so you yeah. have to, yeah, have a, an, yeah. You have to have and, a maker, right? Yeah, and people have really, I mean, I have seen people that that have now been way more open to general conspiracies because of flat Earth, absolutely, hmm. and uh, it's a blessing and a curse. You know, I I love people to be more open minded. However, there's now people that that believe that every single conspiracy is absolutely one hundred percent true. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of conspiracy that contradict each other, you know. The, I've, I've noticed that. Yeah. And be, when you when that happens, then 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 you should see their thought thought processes. I mean, they're all over the place. They're like, well, it's this, it's this, and then I, which is why I made a video some time ago. Um, I referenced a um, Twilight Zone episode, one of the one of the the best ones ever, called "The Monsters Are Doing Maple Street," yeah. where. You know, classic. this is classic where, I mean, that was made in the freaking late 50s, early 60s, where, you know, the people were absolutely paranoid of each other, but it didn't take much to do it. Meaning, you know, well, all you had to do is throw people in a, you, you launch, you create people, you, you put people in a situation where it cultivates suspicion and wow, it's, it's phenomenal. And it was not out of bounds. I mean, you know, yeah, things got really lit up by the end, but you got to remember the era it was. And it wouldn't be that much different now, except for social media. You kill the internet, you know, you put it in people, you can, you can have people turn on each other pretty fast. Yeah, definitely. I was reading a review or a description of Behind the Curve, the documentary mentioned earlier, and they referred to Flat Earth believers as some of the most ridiculed people on the planet. As, we, as we're wrapping up here, I'm just curious, if someone was attempting to change your mind, if someone wanted to have discourse with you, in your mind, is, um, is ridicule a helpful approach in changing your mind? If somebody calls you crazy or stupid, is that helpful to you in, to, in changing your thinking? No, no, not, no, not at all. Um, as a matter of fact, the, I go the other way, whereas people, people say, well, you know, why don't you get mad when, when people come at me and they say, oh, you're stupid, you're a retard. And it's like, well, I can't because five years ago I used to be on that side of the fence. 
you know, it's it's be hypocritical for me. You know, people say, why don't you lose your patience? Because I've done interviews that have been really hostile. And I and said, why, why did you, you know, why did you stay calm? And I go, how, how could I get mad at them? I go, I was there. I, it's like, look, I don't blame you. I, I'd be mad too. I, you know, that's how I was. I mean, I was literally, literally the first time I even clicked on a flat earth video five years ago, almost six now. Um, I literally got physically flushed. It was weird. I was embarrassed. And I was alone in a room with curtains drawn, right? And I was embarrassed to click on this. I'm going, what the hell? I've been clicking on weird stuff on the internet for a long time. <laughs> nothing is embarrassing. Well, maybe a few things, but nothing, you know, this shouldn't even phase me at all. And I realized at that point, it's like, wow, there's something happening here. There's a conditioning thing that I didn't realize was in me, which was mm -hmm. why am I getting really worked up over clicking on this video? And yeah, and it is, it's the most polarizing topic I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Ever, ever, ever. I don't care what, what topic you're talking about. I've never seen a topic that has generated so much so many emotions on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Well, for the record, I do not think you are crazy, and I nice. most certainly do not think you are stupid. I definitely think you're wrong, but uh, that's what discourse is about. That's I think fine. It's, uh, that's uh, fine. As we, as we, I appreciate your time. You have been so uh, gracious to interact with me, a total random stranger from Ohio. I've learned a lot by listening to you. I'm trying to get a glimpse into the way you think, and I got that today. Uh, cool. Biggest, hardest-hitting question for last. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Only if there are large, tasty slices of Canadian bacon. Only. Good call. I'll allow that. That's a good call. Uh, before we talk today, um, I'm, I'm in the same boat, by the way. I worked at a pizza shop, and yeah. talking about paradigm shift, all right, I worked for years convinced that uh, pineapple was nasty, and then I tried it one night, and I was converted. And so uh, yeah. there's a great metaphor for our conversation. Uh, yeah. Before we uh, talk today, uh, I mentioned to you that if you have a charitable cause or an organization, something you're passionate about, that I'd be happy to make a, a donation just as a way to thank you. Is there a certain cause or something that you're passionate about in terms of a charitable um, yeah, if there was going to be any cause, it would be a, um, whatever local, I, I don't know what city you're in, but a local woman's shelter that's closest to you. You know, I, I believe that women's, you know, women have gotten the short end of the stick for a long, long, long time. And, uh, I, I, I support them anyway I can. Well, thank you for sharing that. I will be, after our call today, making a small donation to Project Woman, a local organization here in Springfield that cares, oh, cool. uh, looks after women uh, in need. And I'll do that in the name of Mark Sargent. I appreciate you being with us. Thank uh, you. As we uh, wrap up, how can people uh, get in touch with you? If they want to learn more, how can they follow you? Where can they find you? Oh, easiest way to find me is just to go into um, YouTube and type in Flat Earth Mark. That'll, that'll pull up a lot of content. Uh, you know, I encourage people to look at just about anybody's content. Uh, there's a YouTube documentary, of course, called um, uh, Behind the Curve. I've got a podcast called Strange World and three books on Amazon. All you have to do is type in Mark Sargent Flat Earth. Just type in Mark Sargent Flat Earth in any, anything. You'll find it. You'll find me. I'm awesome. easy. And my, phone, and my phone number and my email address and my physical address are all out there. Feel free to reach out. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks so much. I cannot thank you enough for being with us. I had so many more questions for you, but who knows? Maybe we'll get a chance to talk again. Sure. Sure, sure, awesome. sure. Well, uh, thanks again, Mark. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. We will end this. This has been Jack Talks with Humans. I talk with a human today. It was Mark Sargent. Uh, I appreciate so much his uh, time with us. And uh, stay tuned. I might have some other guests to talk to soon. Uh, have a good one. Stay safe out there. I'll see you next time.